So how significant is it that the United States government came out a year ago and admitted that unidentified aerial phenomena are real? Whatever they are, they're a real mystery. I think it tells us that, uh, first of all, the government has been lying to us for the last 60 or 70 years. I think it gives solace to people who have been told that they were crazy to have been believing or seeing this. So that, to me at least, from the personal point of view, from the human point of view, that's one of the most important things. I know this is speculative, but why do you think the US government's lied? I think it's because, frankly, they didn't understand what it was, and nobody wanted to admit that, first of all. But second, they didn't want to admit that they didn't have control over our airspace. We didn't have control over our own airspace. So the government's been lying, but do you think there's been a cover-up? Absolutely. I mean, there has been both uh, a cover-up as well as a disinformation campaign to make people look like they uh, were crazy. See, this is amazing to me, to hear a scientist of your reputation saying this. I mean, you're one of the most eminent immunologists on the planet. You're a Nobel Prize nominee. You're, you're somebody highly respected in your area of medicine. Is it a dangerous thing for you to admit that you think these things about the phenomenon? I think it's dangerously necessary. I think that this is the kind of thing that if we continue to ignore it, if we continue to ignore the potential danger of what it might represent, we are putting ourselves uh, at risk uh, both to what it might do to us in some time in the future, but then ignoring the physics of what these things are capable of doing. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. What is it? You know, I wish I knew, and of all the people that I've spoken with on the inside, there's uh, really very little unanimity about what it is, except for that there, whatever it is appears to be so far advanced from us that it beggars understanding. So you don't think it's human? Oh, I'm sure it's not human. Is it intelligent? Yes. It certainly acts it, and in some cases it seems to have a sense of humor. So, Gary, the, the implications of what you're saying there are enormous, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You're suggesting that there is a highly advanced civilization that is intelligent, mm -hmm. it's not human, mm -hmm. and it's real. Yeah, I almost hesitate even to call it a civilization. A civilization implies uh, a lot of interacting parts uh, that are moving towards some sort of goal. I, I think that what we're going through today with this realization, it's uh, it's kind of like you've lived on an island your whole life and you've looked across the ocean and you've never imagined there was another island with anybody else on it. And then suddenly a ship with sails shows up. Uh, you don't understand it, but you realize that suddenly your world just got a lot bigger. I think we're in one of those moments right now that our world view, our galactic view is opening, right, to something a little bit bigger. And not just that there might be somebody else, but that there's something else. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is yet to be understood. And the fact that it isn't understood to me is what's exciting, because I can fill it with my dreams. Yeah. And I was thinking, okay, so here you are, you're a jet pilot, you're flying around and this thing is basically going like this and making right angle turns. What can think that fast? I mean, these things are going at 10,000 miles an hour. So you're deciding when to take, uh, or, so getting from point A to point B is less than a second. And then you make another decision to go this direction and another decision to go that direction, all in the space of less than a second. So you have two possibilities. One, whatever it is that's driving it is thinking very fast. So it could be just a computer. Or two, what's going on inside the craft and time flow within the craft is going slower than otherwise. So I think, you know, there's there's a lot of things about the movements and observables that we can use to start to derive potential boundary conditions on what it is that's driving this. Uh, what's, what's behind the scenes? Did any of the people you interviewed see anybody in control of these craft? See any... Not in this, not in these cases, but I in the injury cases, I do know of cases non-injury associated where things were seen. What kind of things? 
little beings. I, I don't know what to say. I know it sounds crazy. I'm I just, don't know I'm just what to say. Like yeah. what, what the eyewitness accounts say. Yeah, the eyewitness I mean, You're not ratifying this. I'm not ratifying it. it. No, the describe eyewitnesses it. always talk about something about that tall, right, with, you know, they call them the grays. I don't know what to but say. But with humanoid features. Humanoid features. Now, I have a problem with humanoid features because, you know, one of my backgrounds is evolutionary biology. Yes. And so I don't see the possibility of something else evolving on another planet that looks like us, you know, unless God is intervening in very specific yes. ways. Almost anything, an octopus could become intelligent and fly around. The yes. Universe. So I think that part of what we're seeing here, I mean, look, if you're an intelligence, are you going to go down on a planet with a bunch of angry monkeys who might kill you? No, unlikely. You'll send some intermediary. Well, what kind of intermediary are you going to send? You're going to send something that maybe almost looks like them, but isn't them. So I think, and this is, again, from inside the intelligence community, most of what we think we're seeing are avatars, biological robots that are basically put there to be the minions, if you will. And that's, that's the current view of that's the intel a, community. That is a... It is a hypothesis. It's, I mean, to me, if I were going to another place or if, if I were going to study a native tribe of, let's say, cannibals, maybe I wouldn't show up in the middle of their village so that I don't inadvertently become dinner. Yes. Right? So you would send an intermediary first. But I've used this example. Uh, I, I don't know if you know Lex Fridman. You probably know Lex Fridman. The, he's an interviewer. Does he's an AI scientist at Stanford? I did one with him, and uh, using the example of the of the ants as well. Let's say that there were a race of intelligent ants at the bottom of your garden. How do you tell them about Instagram? Right? How do you talk with them? How do you interact with them? You would probably make something that looked almost like an ant, and you'd put it down there. But then, how are you going to interact with them? Well, with pheromones, that's how they talk. But you do something else, right? You're, you're speaking about whatever it is you talk about at the dinner table. But you, to translate down to their terms, you would have to use some sort of an intermediary. So it's kind of a lost in translation problem, right? You, you want to put something there that can interact with them so that they can know that there's an object. But you, for instance, you're not going to show up and put yourself in danger. I wouldn't. I mean, we send drones. But also, I would also say, don't believe everything you see. Right? Um, just because you see something doesn't mean it's actually there. You know, there's, there are enough stories about people who feel that these things are projections. Right? That, uh, so maybe it's something projected into an individual's mind. Again, this is all conjecture. And I, again, I want to warn the various skeptics who love to write little nasty grams about me. Um, you know, I'm not uh, a born and true believer. I uh, am interested in finding out what the truth is about these things. Uh, I feel that given that there are enough individuals who seem to report seeing the same things uh, or experiencing the same things, that there's a story here that needs to be explained. It's either mass hysteria, uh, some form of Jungian uh, collective unconscious kind of thing, or it's, or it's something real. But then once you get to the it's something real, how real or unreal is it? And again, if, you, if people are familiar with um, John Keel and Jacques' uh, primary theses on this, that it's, you know, there's, there's an element of irre irreality to this that has yet to be understood. It drives me crazy, you know, thinking about it. Um, and you know, anybody, especially with Jacques, uh, with the background and knowledge about what it is that, that Jacques involves himself with, is he's always looking for what's behind the what's behind, right? That what you're presented is, um, as he often has called it, a form of kabuki theater. Right, it's, it's, it's something which is meant to be an intermediary or a stand-in for an objective, 
right? That these beings or whatever that people claim that is that they see aren't necessarily the the beings or the, the or the consciousness as you're interested in that's actually driving the process. That there's something put there in the stead of whatever this higher level consciousness Which is. Dr. Carlson is that what intelligence in its right mind <laughs> to the extent uh, would put itself in danger of interaction with a primitive civilization like us relatively speaking i mean we're primitive i mean we're 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 not only barely out of the caves we're we're close to putting ourselves back in them you know from from some kind of global catastrophe mistake that we initiate so why would you put yourself at danger of interaction? Why wouldn't you put some kind of avatar in between yourself and, as I've often called us, the angry monkeys? And so you wouldn't in your right mind. And so I think that I, I'm 100% sure that even in the case of the Virginia event, that whatever that was is some kind of avatar and it wasn't actually the object that it, it, it wasn't actually it's it was a thinking co perhaps conscious object but it isn't what's actually behind the scenes that's just a guess i have no proof i don't have i i, I don't get i don't get a weekly email from the illuminati that tell me these things i'm not an insider in any grand sense of the of the word it just right now it makes sense with the data it's a possibility new data will maybe change my mind on it. Earlier, you mentioned, and many people mentioned this, that it's it may be that there is some component of projections when it comes to UAPs. Mm -hmm. And then it can't be all that, because like you said, yeah. there's some physical evidence. And then I was thinking, I've heard this from many other people, that depending on the culture at a specific time, the beings, if there are beings, they make themselves comprehensible to that culture. So mm -hmm. for example, perhaps they appear to Sylvan beings like woodland beings or angels mm -hmm. to later generations, mm -hmm. right. and technology to us, to a godless nation. However, I don't think it can be just projections because when it comes to the technology side, there were reports of ancient flying Roman shields. Right. And then the government right. also seems to be in possession of actual craft, which means they're physical. So what accounts mm -hmm. for this? Well, there's two kinds of projections. We think of projection in terms of our, you know, let's say current, understanding a projection of something on a on a 2d movie screen right um now you can have sort of a holographic projection which is something which appears to be there and you know as and is in and of itself emanating or reflecting light there's a projection of something potentially into your head that makes you think you see something but you know again if you're talking about a technology that's you know, millions of years ahead of us, maybe it can project material objects. You know, Jacques uses the term often, the phenomenon can take a hold of a volume of, of space and make irreality real, right? It can, it can literally change space and manifest uh, material objects. That's a form of a projection. At right? that point, does it still retain the word projection? Because if something was created here, then it persists yep. in multiple people. Well, I mean, the question is, is what is created uh, actually functional here in our reality? Or is it just a piece of plastic that's moved from behind the scenes and made to look like it does something? So, for instance, let's talk about the so-called craft that people see. I mean... I would like to think that there's an object with a physics and a, uh, a physics that can be understood from sitting here in our 3D, 4D world. But maybe, let's say, there's a multidimensional reality and whatever it is that is driving these objects sits somewhere else. And it's basically something that it pokes into our reality and it's it's moving it from elsewhere. It's made to look like it's moving here, but it has no functionality here. The functionality doesn't reside in our side of, of, the, of the veil. The functionality is elsewhere. 
So, you know, we might get one of these objects, let's say, let's say there's a crashed craft or, or beings or whatever, and they are no more real than, a, you know, a, 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 a sculpted object, right? They, they, don't have the, they don't have the function here. The function is driven from elsewhere. And there's another peer-reviewed paper called The Wow Signal in the Genetic Code by a couple of mathematicians from, I think, Uzbekistan. Hmm. Uh, and I don't pretend to understand the math, and I'm sure there's some statisticians that would argue with it, but their concept was interesting. Hmm. The, um, the, com- the actual, what we call the genetic code, the, the uh, transfer RNAs that basically say, you know, a proline goes here, a leucine goes there, that allow for the um, proteins to be made. Hmm. Um, they are so well organized in terms of the structure of the of who codes for what, um, that it looks like it was designed, right? And then they go through some mathematical models of why it had to have been designed. And, you know, there's some caveats that I'll mention at the end here, uh, that uh, the chance of it not having been designed is like one in several hundred trillion. Right. Right. And th- what they're saying is the wow message. So you've heard of this thing called the wow message that when somebody first thought that they heard a radio signal from another civilization, they said, wow, and they wrote wow on it. And that became the wow signal. Okay. So they said, look, the signal is actually in our DNA. The fact that the that DNA was planned and organized is right there in front of us. That's the wow signal. Huh. 